You're listening to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. And now Rish Outfield, Big Anklevich, and O eight O T. Privet Tovarish. Welcome to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 3, page 78. We are your hosts. I'm Rish Outfield. I'm Big Anklevich. And yes, him in the corner, R080T. That's right. Today's story is With Mars in His Hand by Bosley Gravel. Bosley Gravel is the author of dozens of short stories in a variety of genres. He has several novel manuscripts reaching the final stages of completion. He has been regularly producing short fiction since 2006. His current work in progress is a slipstream detective novella featuring Evil Incarnate. Hmm. You can find out more about his published work, current projects, and several reprints released under the Creative Commons license at his website, www.ripcot.com. R-I-P-C-O-T dot com. With Mars in His Hand first appeared in the Forbidden Speculation Anthology, edited by Seth Crossman, and is available on Amazon.com. We'd also like to thank Amory Lowe for lending his voice to today's episode. With Mars in His Hand by Bosley Gravel. Two months ago, Javi would never have guessed he'd be smuggling his wife's corpse into a museum. He blasted a third guard with his gun. He didn't envy the poor fellow, but the guard would live. The alarm was a rhythmic, wild chirp that would have disoriented him if he hadn't expected it. His mirrored helmet was shaped like some kind of wolf or dog. The kids wore them as a fashion, but Javi wore it for utility. This one had been modified to muffle the noise from the alarm. Fourteen years in the Corps of Engineers was perhaps good for something after all. Two more guards turned the corner. There was no hesitation as they fired blue beams across the room. Javi flung himself behind the cryo-coffin as it waved in the air as a log might upon water. He drew it down. All this would be for naught if they ruined a meal's exquisite flesh. Javier Helcor, we have been authorized by the state to take your life. The voice was being transmitted on all the channels and Javi heard it through the speakers of his helmet. We don't want to do this, the voice said. Javi clenched his jaw, pressed a button on the coffin, and let gravity hold it to the floor. The ship was in the next room over. Leave me be. I just want my grandfather's ship, and I'll be gone. He spoke into the microphone embedded into his mask. You're upset, Javi, the guard broadcasted back. That ship will never get off the ground, and if it does, you'll be sorry you got that far. The guard didn't finish. Javi's accomplice blasted the two guards in the back. He motioned to Javi, who already had the coffin floating in the air. The accomplice, his head covered by the mirrored helmet in the shape of a hawk, disappeared around the corner. Javi rushed to keep up. And there it was, the Nagal Planet Hopper, the first fully functional, self-sufficient, interplanetary, four-man star cruiser. Javi's accomplice was already hacking the perimeter lasers. The protection was mostly for show anyway. The curators had long since removed the ship's heart, a synthetic crystal core. Javi hoped the one he had saved for some 30 years still had the magic in it. The accomplice was through the first pathetic defense of the exhibit. He physically forced the door open after some crude fumbling. The ship looked surprisingly like the flying saucers of the 20th century's bad science fictions. But it was only a superficial resemblance. Once the thing was airborne and the shields went up, it would look as smooth and sleek as any modern spacecraft. Grandad had built this prototype in his spare time. He stole minutes here and there, like a poet might compose a line or two. And what had resulted was many years ahead of its time. Javi, get over here. We have less than ten minutes to get this Rube rocket off the ground. Copy that. Javi squeezed the coffin through the door. He disappeared into the ship's hull while his accomplice nervously guarded the ship. The coffin was a hindrance in the small cockpit, but they worked around it. Javi pulled off his mask. 
He was a handsome man, with a trim black beard and dark brown eyes, reflecting a fathomless sorrow. He bit down on his lower lip and watched the small panel that split four ways, each pane covering a quarter of the outside view of the ship. More guards were gathering, pointing their guns. A guard's voice came through the discarded helmet's earpiece. Javier, please surrender yourself. Your service credit to the state will be considered. You know the ship can't fly. Javi slid the crystal into place. His accomplice fiddled with some knobs, and the spaceship came alive with a quiet whirr. Outside, the guards were scrambling, confused at the ring of rolling blue fire that built under the machine. The wooden mounts vaporized and the ground blackened. The accomplice spoke. Is it a go? Yes, Javi said. He turned on the space barrier and pulled the throttle. It shot upwards, crashing through the ceiling leaving the guards on the ground pointing and shaking their heads. The accomplice, Aruno Rickle, took off his mask. He was, in a way, beautiful to Javi. Aruno was the twin brother of Emil. His eyes were pale blue as if God himself had touched them, flecked with pieces of shattered planets, moons, whole ringed solar systems. His eyes gleamed a dozen different colors, his hair, like hers, hung in tight curls down the back of his neck. Aruno looked to the four consoles and watched the sphere of Earth become smaller and smaller. Like the retrospect of a drunk waking the next morning, he shook his head and put it gently in his hands. Another 18 hours until Mars, Javi said, ignoring Aruno's quiet regret. The seeds? Aruno asked. Got them. Wouldn't be here if I didn't. Javi opened a pocket on his suit dug around and pulled out a plastic bag full of what appeared to be acorns. Trees, Javi said, and handed them to Aruno. Do you think they'll grow? Do you think she'll want them? I don't know, Javi said, already engrossed in the controls. Aruno watched the view panel that pointed towards Mars, a faint red star among all the rest. You know the ship will only take two of us back. Of course, Javi said with irritation. I told you as much. It's too late to back out, and you know that, so sit down and shut up. Aruno took no offense. Emil had been the world to Javi, and to him, and anyone who had met her. The Negal planet hopper set down on Mars gracefully. All worked as designed. Aruno had been here once before, and he had hated it. In those days... Before all the death had come on its pale horse, he had been a contractor. He'd delivered supplies here. The place was haunted, he felt, not only by the thousands of Chinese who had starved to death here some 450 years ago, but the ghosts of the desperate cult members who were drawn here decades later never to return. He knew Mars was a graveyard, and he had come anyway. Javi and Aruno waited in the airlock with their helmets on as pistons hissed, and vents closed and pressurized. They entered the welcome chamber. The room had not changed much from when it was built. Chinese writing dominated the signage, but tiny English letters had been worked into the information. When the needle gauge on the wall was pointing to a blue spot between the two red zones, they removed their helmets. Javi felt the artificial gravity tugging at him. What you want? The voice said, the creature springing from the shadows with surprisingly light steps. It was ancient, and perhaps was, once upon a time, human. Its only garment, a silky robe, hung around its neck. Chino? Javi asked. The creature stood up. It had long, smooth breasts, waxy brown like the rest of its body. Its face was covered with light white fuzz that matched its ponytail. The false gravity had pulled its pot belly into the same shape as its breasts. I got a lot of names, it said and stood up. It was female, Javi decided, only because it lacked an appendage between its legs. But call me what you will. We've got seeds. Seeds? Chino said and gurgled something in her throat, then spat on the ground. Get out! One long brown finger with a knuckle bulging pointed at the airlock. Javi held them up in the bag. Chino sniffed the air. Infertile, she said simply. She walked towards them, her eyes on the coffin. What's in that box? Another smelly corpse. Can you really raise the dead? 
Aruno said. Chino replied. Not for seeds, for plants. Plants for my garden, not seeds. So you can? Javi asked, his hands trembling. Maybe. She sniffed the air around the coffin. (laughs) You brought the plague, yes you did. She died of it, Aruno said softly. No matter. Old Chino has lived here a long time. Ate a lot of meat. She isn't afraid of the plague. Will you help us? Javi asked. She thought for a moment. No, Chino said finally. Javi sighed deeply. I'm sorry, he said. But I'm a desperate man. He pulled his gun. Chino grinned. What do you want? The pain? Aruno and Javi both fell to their knees, fingers pressed into their ears. Yet they could still hear her. Stupid! Stupid, stupid! Can't snuff me! She said. Javi had long since dropped his weapon. She picked it up and pulled out the safety chip, sniffed it once, and then popped it into her mouth, gagging as she choked it down. It took them a moment to recover from whatever magic she had defended herself with. They shook the ringing from their heads and reamed their ears with their fingers, trying to shake the confusion from their consciousness. Maybe, she said. I have a good idea. You grow the seeds, grow them in my garden. If plants are strong, I'll raise her up. Aruno pulled Javi into a corner of the room. She's crazy, Aruno whispered. Oh yes, yes I am, Chino yelled. No doubt on Mars. Aruno glanced at her and then back to Javi. Javi, please be truthful to yourself. She can't raise the dead. She's just some crazy old woman kept alive by God knows what kind of drugs and tech. I'm staying. These seeds will grow. I know it. Aruno shook his head no and put his hand on Javi's shoulder. She was my sister, and I want her back too. Take the ship. Go to Venus. Emil told me you have the deed to your parents' property there. Javi looked at Chino, who was mumbling to herself and measuring out lengths of air with her fingers. Take it or leave it, she said. My garden wants me. Javi? Go, Javi said. Aruno nodded. Javi was a ruined man, anyway. He'd be imprisoned on Earth, and he'd die of a broken heart if he came with him to Venus. They'd have to leave Emil's corpse. There wasn't enough fuel for the three of them. Aruno was positive that if anyone could die from sorrow, it would be Javi. And he didn't want to watch it happen. Thank you, Javi said. For not making this... Don't thank me, Aruno said, looking around. Chino had one leg propped against the wall. She scratched herself in a most unladylike fashion. Thank yourself, he finished. Chino's garden was huge, both in the size of the plot and the size of the flora. For unknown reasons, the plants grew to unreal sizes. The citizens of the garden varied and came in all forms. Tiger lilies the size of men, mushrooms the size of children, Hibiscus hung their heavy heads like drunken men at a bar. Javi held the bobbing coffin behind him as he took in the sights and smells of the garden. Fruit trees like apple, fig, and pears accented the whole room. A great dome let in the light and huge machines pumped the air into the rest of the colony complex, and return vents brought it back. Javi was struck by the beauty of the garden as well as the simplicity of the dome engineering. Chino had somewhat solved the problem that killed the original colony. Food and air, at least for a few people, was being generated in a self-sufficient cycle. In the center of the garden was a large phallic fountain that humidified the whole room. Through the seemingly clear dome, Javi saw the Nagal planet hopper raising up on a length of blue fire. When you get hungry, have some fruit, Chino said. Javi looked around. Where can I keep the cryo coffin? Put it with the others. Follow me, she said. Chino led him down a path through the garden. Eat the fruit, but I say don't eat that one. She pointed. Javi glanced at it momentarily. It looked like nothing special to him, small golden berries. Why? Nightmares, she whispered. They cut off to the left where the path quickly came to a hooded area. A dozen cryo coffins lay in disorder. Javi's eyes shined. Yes, some of them were empty. He recognized some models as being well over 70 years old. Did you raise this many? He asked. 
Many, many. A handful of the coffins were still sealed. What about these? Can't raise them all, she said. When they don't pay, I don't raise. Javi parked Emil's coffin. He pressed a button. The hood became translucent, and he gazed upon her. Finally, the feeling that she was only sleeping was warranted. The milky barrier between them blurred her image. Chino was licking her lips and looking over his shoulder. Good-looking meat, she said shyly. She's my wife. Not food, you crazy bitch. Chino looked guilty, her face twisted up and a look of deep personal hurt. I know about you, he said. I've heard the stories. They say you were the only one alive up here. Your government hid the fact your colony was in famine, not to mention all your followers. Where are they now? You'd eat them up too, she said, scratching herself again. Mister, mister, who never ate the dead. If you are hungry, you'd do it too. And follow us tasty, tasty. She smacked her lips. Javi shook his head angrily. Look, Chino, this coffin has what amounts to a small nuclear bomb inside it. I've been chipped with enough smart silicon to blow this thing from across the planet with a simple hand gesture. It will take half of Mars with it, and I've got nothing to lose. If you try to tamper with the coffin, I promise it will detonate. Chino considered this for a moment. (laughs) You're telling me stories, she said. Go plant your seeds. She whipped her robe around her and wandered off into the garden, mumbling to herself in Chinese. Where do I plant them? He yelled after her. Wherever, whenever, she said, and disappeared off into the jungle of plants. He found a shovel and a bucket in a small makeshift shed, then wandered the garden. A library of pleasant fragrances worked into his nose and mouth. He could taste the nectar and the pollen on the artificial breeze. Nothing like this existed on Earth, he thought, or probably ever would. The flowers loomed with a strange anthropomorphic presence. Small mechanical bees buzzed, exchanging pollen and grooming the plants. Javi knew these were the more expensive ones from the way their wings buzzed, for he had designed the computer brains and bodies and written the code that made them run. He had pioneered the science of reverse bioengineering. These bees would have a hive somewhere, and it would be dripping with amber honey. He passed the tree that Chino told him never to eat from. Poison, he thought? What else could it be? He had been searching for a patch of dirt, but everywhere seemed to be mulched with mounds of dead plants and leaves. He picked a spot and ran his shovel down the earth, testing the texture. An angry howl came from the dirt. Ah! Javi stepped back fearfully. Not here! Not here! Chino pulled herself from the mulch. Where then? Javi said, his voice a cross between anger and fear. I was sleeping a good sleep, too. You watch out. You can only sleep when the ghosts let you. She said and shook the loamy mulch from her wizened body. She picked the bits that still clung to her with thin fingers. Ghosts? Mars is all ghosts. She said, Nothing but ghosts of the living and the dead. Spare me your ignorant religion. Where should I plant these seeds? Here is fine, she said. Plant your seeds. Javi scraped away at the ground. I'm going somewhere else to finish my nap, Chino said. Go then. He struck the dirt with the shovel. Although he had no experience, his instinct told him that he should till the soil, and so he did. He dug deep and turned the dirt back into the resulting hole, until it was smooth and fine. These seeds would grow, he promised himself. If he had to breathe his own life into them, they would grow, and he would be with Emil again. He pushed them six inches into the soil and covered them. He fetched water from the fountain and watered the seeds. The dome grayed itself. It was not truly transparent, but only mimicked the outside world. Like a great glass eye, it watched the universe and interpreted the results for those who lived under its protection. In the gloaming, he made his way to the pile of coffins. He found a large one, removed the door, and tore the lining from another. He set it down next to a meal, climbed in, and covered himself with the liner and tried to sleep. But his mind kept whispering a macabre plan of opening the coffin next to him and brushing his lips against Emile's cool flesh. 
of holding her close and weeping. And what if Chino couldn't raise her? Then Mars would have two more ghosts, he thought. He dreamed of Golgotha, the place of bones. He was out in the barren red surface of Mars. The wind had whipped this rock into the shape of a skull. The bones and skulls of a thousand people lay half crushed, piled up around it. Chino was perched on top, gnawing on a fresh piece of bloody meat, holding it by a great chunk of white bone. The blood dripped down her chin and her chest. Then he could see the ghosts. It was as if Mars was nothing more than the dead embodied. Trying to see Chino on her bone pile was like trying to see through tears. But the tears were souls, lost and angry. Where was Emile's ghost in this mess? Where in this mass of writhing angry spirits? Would Chino pick one at random and animate Emile's perfect flesh with it? He woke, <gasps> gasping in air. The dome was still dark. He took several minutes to calm himself down. He could see stars in the glass dome, and as he ran his eyes over them, he realized the view was forged. There were mistakes in the constellations. For some reason, he took comfort in this and let himself drift back into sleep. Gray streaked his once black hair, his ears drooped slightly on the sides of his head. The difference in his appearance was not subtle, but time is the one force man had never tamed, nor ever would. As a child, Javi had played the ancient game of paper, rock, scissors with his grandfather. He thought now of the great width, the length, the depth of the universe. Time trumped them all. It trumped love, indifference, and soon, he hoped, it would trump greedy death. He had braided his beard tightly, and it still hung to his groin. He looked up at his tree, stroking the thick braid. He had built a small day camp here, but always returned at night to sleep next to Emile's coffin. The clocks here were unpredictable, jumping ahead hours, even days. He notched a stick when the dome grayed, but perhaps even that was not accurate. Per his morning ritual, he made a notch and laid the stick with the other sixteen. The tree was taller than him now, but as the flowers grew large, the tree grew stunted, as if some great force had equalized all the plants of this garden. He hadn't seen Chino in nearly two years, but this was not too strange. She came and went, perhaps burying herself deep in the loamy ground for months at a time. He had given up searching for her long ago. Wherever she went, he could not find her or follow. So he waited. When she appeared again, he would force her to raise a meal. It had been long enough. It had been long enough ten years ago. Chino had been right about the ghosts. They haunted every moment of his sleep and sometimes when he was awake he would hear their murmurs. But never a meal. Why not a meal? Where was her ghost? What chance did Chino have when her soul still haunted the earth and not this ghoul-infested chunk of rock? Chino! He yelled. It's time. I'm going to beat the wrinkles out of your stinking carcass if you don't show yourself. No reply came. Just the quiet buzz of the mechanical bees. Chino! Nothing. For a month, he stalked her in the forest of flowers. He'd often catch the tail of her rope just leaving sight around a bend, or a couple of footprints pressed into the mud. Sometimes she would cackle and he would follow the noise, but to no avail. Other days, he'd beg and plead as he wandered the garden. Often he'd find her waists buried like tiny corpses in shallow graves. He found the beehive during one of his long searches. Indeed, it was dripping with honey. The hive was a tall structure, semi-organic, semi-machine. The backside dripped unharvested honey. He tapped the exposed buttons, and a screen and an input device unfolded itself. He overrode the programming so the bees would not bother him. He poked his fingers into the dripping honey and pushed them into his mouth and licked the sticky sweetness, savoring its richness. 
That's mine, Chino said, appearing from behind the raspberry bush. Javi, not wasting a second, grabbed her by the throat. She instantly invaded his mind, bringing him to his knees, Ah! his huge hand pulling back as if he was being electrocuted. Rude! Eat my honey and try to snuff me. Rude! Rude! She said and released him from her hold. He stood up. The tree has grown, he said, gasping for breath and massaging his hand. It felt like the muscle might have torn. Yes, promises forever, she said. So you'll do it? If you leave my honey alone. I will, he said. When? Soon, she said. Stars have to be just right. How long? He asked. One week, she said. One week, he repeated back. And if you don't, I am blowing up Mars. She looked him in the eyes and he hoped she could see the sincerity in them. Doesn't work sometimes, she said. Sometimes the dead want to be dead. The tree has grown, he said. I have nothing more to live for. Why is she so special? Chino asked. You can get a new wife. Because she was my universe. She was what all other beauty is judged by. She was perfect. Bah, Chino said and licked her lips. Never was anything perfect in this universe. Except maybe my garden. He shook his head. You are wrong. She shrugged. The next week was agony to Javi. Each second seemed to spasm for an eternity. But finally, the time passed. Chino came to him, her arms full of huge flowers. Her lips pulled back, showing off her teeth worn down to the gums. She inspected the tree somberly as she walked around it twice, then carefully retracing her steps. Beautiful. Come on, come on. I knew you could do it. Javi followed her as she led the way to Emil's soon-to-be-living body. It only took minutes before they got to the coffin. Open it up, Chino said. You know this can only be done once. I can't seal it again. Chino shrugged from behind her load of flowers. Only need once, she said. Javi typed in some codes on the keypad. The coffin seemed to gasp, almost like an infant's first breath. Chino shuddered at the sound. A meal was the eye with which the universe beheld itself, thought Javi. He felt weak, as if he might faint from looking upon her perfection. Chino dumped her armload of flowers into the coffin. Good looking, Chino said, licking her thin brown lips, and started organizing the flowers. It took a few moments, and when Chino was done, a meal was fittingly wreathed in flowers, their beauty paling in contrast. Chino put two pink begonias on her eyes. Is it working? Javi asked. No, Chino said. But I only started. She had a small length of branch and several of the fruits she had warned him about hung on it. They were small, perhaps no larger than the tip of his thumb. I thought they were poison. No, the fruit of life. Only plant native to Mars. The first tree in my garden. Chino pried open Emil's mouth and pushed one in. Don't hurt her, Javi said. Oh, mister, mister, she is still dead right now. He clenched his jaw. Raise her up. Chino looked at him nervously. Can you really snuff my garden? Yes. Oh, she said and lifted one of Emil's perfect feet and examined the soul. She put her ear to it, listened for a moment, and put it back down gently in the coffin. The bells, Chino said. Not without the bells. She began patting herself down. Javi considered with disgust where she might have stored any bells she might be carrying. But she came up empty-handed. She shook her head. I'll be right back. I expect you will. Javi looked at his watch. In ten minutes. Or you know what I'll do. Sure, sure, she said, and wandered off, not even hurrying, it seemed. His watch read eight minutes, and he was beginning to curse under his breath. Another three minutes passed. He watched the third minute cycle by on his watch. Chino wandered back, her fingers now adorned with tiny bells that jingled as she came. She snapped her fingers at Javi. I'm late, she said. Mars is still here. I gave you the benefit of the doubt. And yourself, too, she said, jingling her hands at him. Get on with it, he said. 
She showed him her gray tongue and rolled her ancient eyes. Emil's beauty was still unreal to him as he watched Chino press her fingers into her cheeks, adjusting the fruit. I ate some, you know, a long time ago, she said. And now I live forever. So will she. You are an old man and she will be young forever. She deserves it. Crazy man, nobody deserves it, she said and began her ceremony. Chino blew her own breath into Emil's mouth, forcing the fruit deep. She massaged her throat as Javi grimaced, and finally turned away when Chino removed the bells from her hand and pushed her small fist down Emil's throat, pressing the fruit deeper and deeper. She sang while she worked, a surprisingly nimble tenor, but he could not understand the Chinese words. He turned back when he heard the bells go back on her fingers. She shook them over the corpse, still singing her haunting song. Javi took one of Emil's hands and gazed at the flowers over her eyes. He prayed to a god that he didn't even believe in, and in the end, it didn't seem to matter. Chino gave up, shaking her head. Can take a while sometimes, or not at all. Javi was weeping now, and when he regained himself, he cursed Chino and chased her away by throwing handfuls of flowers from the blanket she had wreathed the meal with. Chino scampered away, cackling like a crow, scolding an intruder. He crawled in the coffin and lay beside Emil, his true love, his hand and hers together, wondering how it had all amounted to this. He squeezed gently, trying to remember the precise gesture that would activate the weapon in the coffin, trying to remember if it was even real or just something he had invented to frighten Chino and deluded himself into believing. His body grew weak with sorrow, and he lay, watching the false sky turn dark, squeezing Emil's hand, hoping perhaps to randomly trigger the bomb, end his life, and shatter this graveyard like a rock under a sledgehammer. And where would the ghost go, he thought. Not Earth. It too was a graveyard now. He was sure it was full of its own restless dead. The plague had brought that final destiny. Venus? Too far, he thought. Working Emil's hand in his, he squeezed with what he hoped was his last movement. But, to his joy, Emil squeezed back. Emil ran her finger over each notch on the stick. Flower petals were still lodged in her hair. Sixteen years, she said. Javi nodded, dazed by her beauty. Every movement she made was a miracle. She looked up from the stick, to him, then to Javi's tree, then further still to Chino's garden. What was it like? Javi asked. He held a branch ripe with the fruit Chino had fed a meal. Quiet, she said. Like a still lake. I, I couldn't dream. A turbine spun up somewhere in the hidden works of the colony. A light breeze blew now, nodding the heads of the flowers and rustling the branches of the tree. How? She asked. I leveraged time, he said. Sometimes all we can do is wait. Tears ran down his face and disappeared into his beard. The couple embraced, fitting together like two pieces of a puzzle. A large mechanical bee flew by, a glitch in its wetware programming causing a clumsy and crooked path. What now? She whispered in his ear. Once upon a time, this place was just a garden. But now it is Eden, he said. They separated and Javi picked a fruit from the branch he held in his hand, examining it, marveling at its simplicity. Now we have all the time in the world. From a hidden place in the forest of flowers, Chino cackled in mirth and then was quiet. <laughs> Author's Note Bosley Gravel here with a few words about the story. With Mars in his hand, I will admit, is one of my favorite stories. Its genesis is in a bit of imagery created by my sleeping mind. One dark and stormy night, I dreamed of a fabulously beautiful woman in a glass coffin. She had curly golden hair and was bathed in the red light of Mars. The coffin stood on its end and cast shadows where something loathsome hid. Once I was awake, I asked myself the question every author is obligated to ask. 
Who was she? How did she get to Mars? Is she really dead? And dear God, what's hiding in those shadows? With Mars in his hand is a direct result of attempting to answer these questions. With a lot of luck and a little digging, I was able to discover what Mars is really about. Patience, loyalty, and unconditional love. Therefore, I dedicate it to my wife of nearly ten years, Gloria, who doesn't spend much time dead, but is certainly the most beautiful woman on this planet. I hope you enjoyed this story, and a version appears in the Forbidden Speculations Anthology, edited by Seth Crossman, and is available on Amazon. Follow the links on the Dean Steve website if you'd like to purchase a copy. A huge thanks for listening, and another huge thanks to the folks at Dean Steve for all their hard work. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the story. It's a good one, I think. What did you think of the story, Rish? It was interesting. Uh, <laughs> you don't sound convinced. No, no, it was. I'm just trying to put into words my thoughts on the story. You know, we came close to putting Lonely Hearts Club and With Mars in His Hand as our Valentine's Day episodes. Because mm-hmm. we were thinking in February we would have, like, romantic stories. But we came up with this idea two days after Valentine's Day. Yeah, that does kind of blow it, doesn't it? Maybe next year. Yes, maybe next year we'll reuse these stories. <laughs> but uh, So tell the people how they can uh, submit a story to us. They uh, send an email to submissions at doonsteve.com. Include their story in that email, and we will peruse the story and pronounce a Judgment. verdict. Oh over it they'll want to uh, be sure to check out the submission guidelines it'll give you a little idea as to what we're looking for and, and where did they find the guidelines the guidelines are on our website dunesteef.com d-u-n-e-s-t-e-e-f dot yeah. com you know that's funny uh, dunesteef <laughs> what the devil is dunesteef uh oh it's like a bug uh, an insect or something what well, just just a bug well, according to the Merriam-Webster's Revised Offline Print Dictionary 2004 edition, uh, Doonstief is a small chitinous crab spider native to the coastal regions of the southern United States. And oddly enough, 90% of the surface of Guam. They are known for their almost painless bite, after which there is minor swelling, joint inflammation, Occasional muscle spasms and the uncontrollable need to name one's child after Elton John songs. Wow. I'll bet my cousin Daniel's uh, dad or mom got bit by one of those. You think? Does he have any siblings? Well, he's got a sister named Levon and a little brother named Can You Feel the Love Tonight? Could be, man. Could be. You said it, 080T. After last episode with the alienating cat lovers and the episode before with, you know, making fun of the Seinfeld theme and, and the week before we're basically mocking anybody who has ever listened to us or, 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 or helped us in any way. I, I thought maybe I'd take a step back and not say anything that, that could possibly offend anyone. So that, that's sort of my goal for this episode. But before I do that, here's a list of 10 religions I hate. Number one. As yeah, far that's going to work. Good thinking. And then you're going to talk about all the political parties you despise too, huh? The following is a list of public figures I think should be dead. Oh, wait, sorry. The, the following Secret is a list. Service will take the you away. The following is a list of beloved public figures <laughs> right. that I think should be dead. No, uh, you know, as far as the story goes, yeah, I think that there was a lot of, of thoughtful stuff there. You know, in the middle of the story while we were reading it, while we were recording it, I made some offhand remark about uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal in The Dark Knight. Through the rest of the story, I kept seeing her as being a meal in the coffin. Yeah, they just keep saying her beauty was breathtaking and all this stuff. And you're just thinking of, boy, you're a pretty one, aren't you? You know, if they ever make a movie of With Mars in His Hand, uh, you know, they just go on and on about Emile's beauty and how perfect she was. And a thousand sunsets were crap compared to her eyes. And, and I'm thinking, Janine Garofalo, what, what, what are your thoughts <laughs> casting you know, it was an interesting story. It seemed like they had a lot of references kind of to, you know, he actually mentions Eden. And it seemed like maybe we had our Garden of Eden of Mars, perhaps. Although, in this case, Adam and Eve eat from the Tree of Life and not from the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil. 
So Adam and Eve are living forever. But that's how the story goes, right? That if they had eaten, or had they already eaten from the tree of they life? They had already eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then they had to make sure they didn't eat from the tree of life so that they would live forever in their sins. So in this case, it's a little different. They eat from the tree of life, and they're going to live forever together, I guess. What well, does that make Chino the serpent? It might. I don't know. Here's my question for you. Do you think Emil and Javi, have they done a good thing, do you think? Well, see, now he's middle-aged. And yes. she's young. So she'll probably drop him for another yeah. immortal, better-looking dude. In the story, uh, Chino says that she partook of the fruit as well. And that's what it turned her into eventually. Or Have Javi and Emil doomed themselves to becoming something like this little monster that we uh, deal with throughout the whole story, or, or are they going to live happily ever after? Well, see, Chino was afraid. Oh, she was afraid for her garden. She wasn't afraid of dying. I was, so she could still die. With immortality in stories, invariably, whether it's a vampire story or a Highlander story or a story about Wolverine or a story about <laughs> your mother-in-law, it's always, uh, eventually they tire of life. Uh -huh. and, you know, so they start to seek a, a way to have peace, and peace is death, right? Not that this story ever really talked about that. Chino seemed pretty darn happy with her immortality. True, but although maybe she crazy. spent months underground. She became an earthworm. If that nuclear bomb went off and Chino was vaporized, does she die or can an immortal person be vaporized? Or is her body impervious even to a nuclear bomb? You know, I hate to get off on, on a tangent, <laughs> but that's something that bothers me is how they've made Wolverine completely immortal uh -huh. and indestructible and all that. And, you know, when he was first created, he just was really, really tough. You know, he, uh -huh. he was an adversary. They, you know, created as a, a somebody that could fight the Hulk. And right. then with years of, of new mythos being built around him, suddenly he became... 200 years old and he became you know that he didn't have a memory of who he was and all this stuff and at first okay the first time they kill wolverine is in days of future past and fire does it you know the sentinel blasts him it burns his skin off of his skeleton and that's it he's dead and then later you know they've done stuff where it's like there's nothing that will kill wolverine yeah didn't you say um, they ripped him in half and like threw the two pieces far apart and then he crawled back and put himself back together and yeah that's ultimate wolverine i don't subscribe to any of that stuff <laughs> but it's probably fun yeah it's probably they're uh, saying he's that indestructible you crack me that up if with the that Hulk ultimate stuff tore him in half see um, that's uh star trek voyager actually um i'm sorry but uh, that's not exactly canon in the Star Trek world. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> well, it's probably an accurate comparison. But I was just thinking the other day, um, Wolverine should be terrified of water because the guy weighs 800 pounds or something like True. that. You drop him in the ocean and he should sink like a stone. I mean, unless he has Superman type powers, there's no way you can swim. If yeah. your skeleton is made of metal, guess um, I don't know. And you know, okay, so who and who could help him? Who could save Wolverine? Colossus. He was made of metal too. You know what <laughs> I mean? He would sink. The only he'd have to turn back into human to bob up to the top, and then he'd lose his strength to be able to lift Wolverine. <laughs> I don't know. It just Jean Grey would fly in there with her super all powerful powers and pull him out. I don't know. But uh, uh, yeah, that's a long tangent. So could Wolverine be vaporized by a nuclear bomb? You think? Oh, totally. He, yeah. I think they've made him a little too invulnerable. Superman couldn't though. This Superman is his, nothing of the sort. His uh, his skin is like impervious. I mean, you nuclear blast him, he'd be all right, right? Superman. I guess. What about a vampire? Well, Vampires, like you said, are immortal. You have to stake them to kill them. Can you nuclear bomb a vampire? Oh, I think so. I, it, look, if, if sunlight, oh, sunlight burns yeah. a vampire to, to cinders, uh, even in the Anne Rice books, the Vampire Lestat books, where they are super immortal, they, they make Wolverine look like a wuss. Um, <laughs> fire still harms them. You know, it just takes 40 years and they heal again. But you know what? There's a million different <laughs> versions of vampires. And if I choose to subscribe to the Buffy type vampires, yeah, of course a nuclear bomb would kill them. Okay. Fire would kill them. What if you subscribe to the Twilight vampires? Then I think sexual intercourse is what would kill them. I, 
<laughs> I, you know, I, I don't know about Twilight vampires, except for that they glow. Yes, they do, and it's so pretty. They have skin like diamonds, and they're so handsome. <laughs> we always meant to talk about those books. I don't know. Have we ever talked about this on the show? I don't think so. But for months, you and I have been talking about, well, someday we're going to do a Twilight episode, and I'll just unleash all my <laughs> ire and wrath and ugh, gnashing of teeth. Now's your chance. Go! But I, I can't make it through the darn book. I, <laughs> I, I've tried twice to make it through that first book, and eventually I just I can't do it. I, I don't have the power. So my niece said it, or my cousin or somebody told me, well, what you need to do is go see the movie, you and Big. And it's like, come on, you can make that sacrifice. You go see the movie, then come back and record an episode about the movie. Uh-huh. And I said, yeah, yeah, I think I can do that. But I just, I so don't want to see that. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. Has just, the movie I, made it to the dollar theater? Because there's no way I'm paying full price. I think it's there. Yeah. Ooh, okay. We may have to have that episode. It'll still be there when... When the DVD comes out? Oh, definitely. It'll be there long after the DVD comes out, but New Moon or <laughs> Eclipse or whatever the next one is called is, is going to be in the theaters, and, and it'll still be playing at that theater. Yeah. Well, I always think it's cool for movie events like that to happen, although I don't think Twilight is one of those movie events. It was for certain people. It's no Titanic. It's no Jurassic Park. It, it is for girls. No. I Titanic th- was Titanic for girls. Girls went and saw that movie ten okay. times apiece. It is for stupid girls. They have not made a fifth of what Titanic made, so obviously it isn't for girls. Well, I don't have an answer for that, except for <laughs> to say that maybe Twilight is crap, and Titanic wasn't. <laughs> I would wasn't. have to agree with that. But I can tell just by watching the trailer that that's the case. And <clears throat> I know that this, in some way, was about Bosley Gravel's story. <laughs> uh, we got lost onto the paths of Wolverine and immortality. You know, many cultures, even religious people, have ideas or myths or legends about immortal people. And lots of times, it's sort of a curse. Uh huh. You know, it's just, uh, this person is cursed to walk the earth. Yeah. And, you know, it's just, I guess, in, in some ways, maybe that's how we perceive damnation, is something that lasts forever, and you always boring are, after a are, while. Are, I, guess. I guess that's part of it. But worse is like Jacob Marley in the Christmas Carol, who is doomed to walk the earth, seeing what he might have done but cannot do uh-huh. for good in the lives of people, and, and carrying the like, chains. And that that sucks, man. That's damnation in my mind. Damnation. I don't know. You and I have a friend who complains. Who was damned? always complains whether it's a story that we've written you or i or a movie he always complains that stories end where he wants them to begin you know it's like one of those movies a horror movie where at the end the plague is unleashed and it's like and it's only a matter of time before it covers the earth roll credits and he's like no that's the movie i want to see is start right there where it's only a matter of time and you know, a lot of times he's got a point. Yeah. You know, Rosemary's Baby, you know, it ends with her realizing that her husband is not the father of this baby, but Satan is the father. The end. And it's like, whoa, 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 I want to see the movie. So, so what about the baby? You know, where, yeah. And um, as far as this story goes, I, I can see our friend saying, okay, so what happens now that she is back? And he has taken this fruit and eaten it, and they, there's no way they can get off the planet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I think that this, of all stories, has the most uh, conversation potential about the ending. Yeah, it definitely does. And when we first received the story, the the ending wasn't as long as it is now. Right, she squeezed his hand. Yeah, she squeezed back the end. And it was one of those things, like, like, like our friend who's always saying, oh, it ended just where I wanted it to start. So we wrote Bosley back and we said, hey, we kind of like a little bit more on the ending. Give us a little something. There were a lot of areas where I thought that the story could improve. And so I asked you to ask him if he wouldn't mind doing another draft. And, and um, part of what I had asked was, and he didn't have to write the whole Adam and Eve on Mars ending. I just sort of wanted clarification that she was back, that she was okay. Because there was that line earlier about could just some random ghost of Mars right. enter into her body? And, uh, you know, I was reminded of the ending of the book Pet Cemetery. Do you know that? Yeah. Where his wife comes back from the dead. He, he doesn't see her or whatever. He just hears her come in the door and then... She says, darling. And that's the end of the book. And as a kid, I couldn't get over that. It's like, what does that mean? Darling, everything is fine? 
You or know Dar- it isn't. He and buried her in the pet cemetery. Darling, I'm coming to remove your head. <laughs> right. But Okay, but Mary Lambert made a movie of it in 89, and they continue it another 30 seconds after Darling, so that there's no doubt in anyone's mind. Um, and while that should satisfy me, I prefer the book sending now. Uh-huh. You know, I guess it's the imagine the power of imagination. What he sees when he turns around in my mind is more horrible than what they did with uh, Tasha Yar's face or what, what uh, uh-huh. Denise Crosby's face. And if you remember, there was just like gallons of pus, and then they start tongue kissing, and the pus is squirting and all that. <laughs> and and then he slurps up. Uh, it, it, it was very similar to that. Oh, yeah. So my question then is for you, uh, now that we've got this extra ending, what do you think? Do you think we should have said, you know, Bosley, you know, we were wrong. We should have left it as it was. Well, it, it sort of ends with Darling. You know, she yeah. squeezes back the end. And it's in my mind, it's just like, okay, so is she going to be the same person? Is she going to be fine? Is she not going to remember her life? Is she going to be a blank slate? Does she start with a baby again? Was she dead all that time and her spirit roamed? And now there's 16 years of torment or whatever that she's never going to get over and all that. These are questions that occurred to me, but they don't need to be answered. Uh A lot of them were. You know, maybe I was out of line to want to know (laughs) more. This is what I'm thinking we should do. I want to get our listeners involved in this thing uh, here. Listener. Oh, right. John Smith, what do you think, one way or another? Get on the blog, leave a comment. Tell us what you think. Was the story good the way we had it, or should we have had it stop where, where it originally ended? Tell us your thoughts. Was Rish out of line in asking for more? <laughs> Did he ruin the the great story? Do we need to go back and edit off that chunk of an ending? What do you think? While we were reading the story, we thought about that. Maybe we could just end right here. But then I thought, okay, well, this guy did the work, and he did the, <laughs> the thinking of this ending, and he might have put a couple of lines in there to pay off in this ending. He wouldn't have added that ending if he didn't feel... I don't know. See, I hate to be... When I was in college... I had a teacher who would give me suggestions for my stories. <laughs> right. But you know what? They weren't suggestions. They were demands. And if I didn't do as she said, you know, I would pay for it. She'd be like, hey, I told you to put in a part where this happened. and You didn't. You would have had an A, but now you've got a C. And it was. It was literally like that, which I think was probably wrong. But at the same time, we are uh, sad little kings of a sad little hill. I would hate that he, that Bosley felt like I was saying, I got to know uh-huh. what's next. And yeah, it's, it's okay. We are editors. So I guess that's our prerogative to ask these questions. But I, he wasn't obligated to answer them. I didn't want Bosley to feel compelled, like my teacher made me feel compelled, to make that change. Mm-hmm. And, and you know what, Bosley, if you did feel like you had to do that, um, then I've misused my power. It's interesting, you know, me and you are just kind of normal guys, but yet here we are as editors as well. I guess we do have that power to say yay or nay, to uh, say change this or change that or whatever. Yeah, I never considered that before, but it is a strange thing because, you know, authors want to be published. They want their stories out there so people can hear them. And so maybe they do feel compelled to do whatever editors say. Okay, well, hey, I read a story either today or yesterday. I've been trying to read and catch up on some of these submissions. Uh And I read a story, and it had the potential to be great, but it was so short. It was like 1,300 words and so sketchy that it it was a pass. And I wondered, is it all right for me to email this guy and say, hey, I'll tell you what. If you double the length of this story and you expand the premise and put more on the beginning or whatever so that we get to know these characters, I'll take it. You can't really say that, though, because if he expands, does all that stuff, and it turns out that it sucks, you basically have to say, okay, expand it, do this, and and send it back, and we'll give you another chance, you know? I, I know this one guy who writes stories. And if you were to tell him to do something like that, he'd say, F you. Right to your face, I think. But we'd have to have a t bleep it out. But then again, 
he hasn't used any bad words yet in today's show. Ah, so. <laughs> <laughs> I know this person. Well, okay. I, uh, here's one more tangent. I, I, I had a different teacher, and you know this teacher. This was the same teacher the that we both had in screenwriting. And he, he loved the things that I wrote. This guy encouraged me more than any teacher ever did, more than my parents. I mean, this guy taught me that my stuff was really good and that I shouldn't be afraid and just write it in a notebook and share it with no one. He would read this stuff in the front of the class. I'm sure always. Much, much to the Never chagrin. Never read my stuff, always yours, over and over every week. It was like, hey, guess what Rish wrote this week? We'd be walking down the hall going to class. Like, hey, what do you think Rish wrote this story about this time? <laughs> you know, that embarrassed me a little bit. But I, I hate to be a poor me sob story kind of thing, but my dad did not like me. And I didn't have any <laughs> older brothers. He, my dad liked my brother more. And I just, I always felt like a complete screw up and a worthless person. And I still do this to this day. I mean, I know I'm not worth much. But my teacher, my professor, he would take me aside and say, hey, this stuff is really good. And nobody had ever done that before. And it just, it amazed me. Anyway, first screenplay I ever wrote was for this teacher. We had this class. It was the class that we shared. And I wrote a full screenplay. And the assignment was... It was like a 30-minute... The assignment was to write a 30-page yeah, 30 kind of thing. And, and I wrote and a like a 140-page <laughs> script. And yeah, I mean, it was so bloated and, and excessive and all that stuff. But it was one of those things where I was, I was passionate and he believed in me. And so I wrote it. And afterward, he said, hey, let's enter this into a contest. Dude, I, And he entered it under his name and took the prize money, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, that's right. It was so awesome. And then he disappeared. He stopped returning my phone calls. No, that was later. And he said, you know, I think I could probably sell this to a studio or to, to some of the people I know. But here are the changes that you, you would have to make. And basically, it was write a whole new script with these two characters where this happens. And we talked about it. And I said, oh, and this could happen and that could happen. And he's like, okay, go do it. And I, I, I didn't want to. I had other stories in me that I wanted to tell. And I had written this script. I had finished it, you know, and I wanted to uh -huh. move on to other stories. And I think that he hurt his feelings or he felt like I didn't respect him. I don't know from this because I, after that, I sort of got a reputation. And, and you know that I got a <laughs> reputation. And not for nothing, sir, that I got a reputation of I don't like people telling me what changes Protective to make. Protective of your work. You blew it. I had the chance to be a real writer and I blew it. And, you know, sometimes I think about that and I think, okay, you know, why didn't I take yeah. 50 or 60 hours and sit down and write that thing that he wanted me to do? Sure, I was in college full time. Sure, I had a job. But why didn't I do that? And yeah, who knows? I, I don't I know. Can, got a lot you of You wouldn't regrets. be living in your mom's basement now, <laughs> if only. I'm, I'm still not living in my mom's basement. I still <laughs> aspire to live there. But, you know, I have a lot of regrets and mistakes that I've made. I don't know that that's one of them, though. And I, you know, I just don't know. I don't know how much that was smoke that he was blowing. Uh huh. Or whether or, he really could have sold it or not. Or whether you know how much of it was him just saying stuff. I'm assuming he could see in me, hey, this is somebody who has never believed in himself. Right. And that, and, and then after that, I think I had a little bit more confidence in my writing. And because my teacher had made it public that I was a good writer, that I had talent, or that I, I was writing, uh -huh. a lot of people saw the stuff that I, I did, and people wanted to make uh, short films of, of the scripts that I had written. But it, somehow, I think maybe my teacher created a monster in me because <laughs> I began to become really protective, like you said, of my work. Frankly, and you've heard me say this before, the audience hasn't, you know, I felt like, hey, I did the work. I stayed up until three or four in the morning writing that very first screenplay when everybody else was out dating or going to work or, or just hanging out or watching sports or sleeping or, or whatever it is. And so when I handed in a full screenplay for that class and everybody else had it in 30 pages, people were like, wow, you really have a lot of time on your hands. And that infuriated me. <laughs> it was like, no, no, I was passionate and I sweated and I worked my ass off doing this. This isn't a non-cursing episode, is it? We'll um, bleep it, I guess. While you guys were out having sex, I was writing this. That's right. And that's I, what I was doing, as a matter of fact, at that time, if I, know, I remember right. Funny. Interesting. Um, that's why my writing sucks so bad. <laughs> 
later when we would collaborate on films and stuff like that, I became just furious at these. And when I moved to LA, I realized that Hollywood is made up of these people who sit behind the desk and they look at something <laughs> that somebody else has created and they pick holes in it or they're like, oh, this is wrong and this is bad. And they have no talent to create or they're not willing to put in the work uh -huh. to create something themselves, but they're more than willing to see what's wrong with your work or to make all sorts of arbitrary changes. Uh, what do they call it? That's, they call that Monday morning quarterbacking they call in the real in world, sports, right? Sports. They talk about the people who sit there the next day and say, oh, yeah, this quarterback should have done this and that. And then they're there for a Monday morning quarterback. But I don't know what they, they would call it in writing. They weren't on the field getting That's their right. spines jarred by these That's linebackers right. that weigh 800 pounds. I'm sorry. I, I, you know, it's funny. I still get a little <laughs> bit emotional about that just because I had so much experience with that. Uh, I, I remember I went to a pitch session when I moved out to L.A. And I only did one, <laughs> but, a, you know, an appointment was made and you go in there and you pitch your screenplay. Uh -huh. And I thought I was pretty cool because I had three full screenplays that I had written. You know, whereas everybody else says, oh, I'm working on a screenplay someday. And, of course, they're never going to finish it right. because, dude, and you know, it's hard to yeah. write. It's hard to write a screenplay or a novel or a short story or even a freaking poem. Yeah. They say there's nothing scarier than the blank page. And, you know, I, I don't know. Asking a girl out always daunted me more than the blank well, page. But I know that a, a lot of people. page of a different sort. Mm -hmm. You're a blank page. Yeah, whatever. Anyhow, so I went to this pitch session. And their time is so precious, so valuable that you have starting now three minutes. Go. And so you're just like uh, instantly the spotlight is shined on you and it's like, oh, crap. OK, so this is my first script and this is the script that I spent six months writing or whatever, <laughs> staying up until four o'clock in the morning instead uh -huh. of having sex to write. And in two seconds, the guy's like, nah, what else you got? And you're like, oh, uh, oh, oh OK. Um, and so I have another script and it's, it's sort of a and it's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Basically, before the three minutes were done. All my scripts were gone, and he's down. like, what else have you got? And so, you know, I began stuttering. I began trying to come up with something else. Uh, and I said, okay, well, you know, I, I had an idea, and I started to tell him, and he's like, okay, give me that. I was like, what? It was an idea. And he's like, oh, okay. Well, you got nothing then. And that was it. That was the end of meeting. And I never went to another one of those, and maybe I needed to develop a stronger spine. Got hit by that linebacker. Yeah, you know? 800 pounds. Oh, I have no tolerance for people like that. Yeah. Well, I definitely understand where you're coming from. But, I mean, the people that are asking you to change things aren't always the people that were out having sex while you were writing uh, the story. You know, there are people who who actually also have talent or or put something into things as well. I mean, for example, you asked Bosley Gravel to change a story. Who, I mean, you didn't put in the time into writing Bosley Gravel's story. I mean, he did that himself. But you've written stories yourself. You've put in the, enough time to where you can say maybe, hey, I like it this way. But, you know, there are people it's worth giving a little credence to. I mean, I remember you having uh, your hackles raised when... Uh, a certain person who makes a living in Hollywood as a writer asked you to change something. Of course, he wasn't making a living in Hollywood as a writer at the time, but... So I'm a, I'm a hypocrite is what you're saying. No, I'm just saying there's so many people who don't know anything that just say, oh, no, you need a severed penis in this story, and then it'll be good. You know, those people, screw them. I mean, they don't know anything, but there are people that do, and sometimes it's hard to tell, or maybe you just blanket assume. Nobody knows anything. I put the time into this. I know what it is, and if anybody tries to tell me what to do with it, it'll screw them all. Well, you know, there's, there's probably got to be a middle ground. Yeah. Because I'm certainly guilty of feeling like I know what good writing is. Who the c*** are you, sex addict, for telling me <laughs> what changes to make? And then at the same time, I'm probably guilty of, uh, of being too timid and saying, you know, I, I, no, nobody would want to read the stuff that I've written as like a reward for donating. You know, that's, that's my actual sentiment right. that I told you when you said, well, why don't we give people some of our stories as thanks for donating? Uh, yeah, there is definitely middle ground. And it's kind of weird because we, we're only a short time in the position of editors having to act like an editor. I don't know if I've developed that skill set yet, but it's our magazine, I guess. You know, we're the ones that are, you know, in charge of it. And so if we think a story needs to change somewhat, I mean, it's not the writer's co-op magazine. It's 
the Dune Steve audio magazine, you know. So the Dune Steve guys are the ones that are supposed to be uh, making the decision. So, I mean, you, I, I guess you can't really feel bad about saying, hey, maybe you should do this instead of that. Okay, well, well good. I, you know, I, I, I don't feel that I've let my position go to my head, but... Then again, maybe I'm on the other side of the desk all of a sudden, and I'm not thinking about this person <laughs> who works really hard when he could have been doing something fun or something easy, uh-huh. and and I just say to you, well, the guy needs to do another draft, and I, and I don't know that this is his sixth draft or or, or, or anything like that. Draft. Maybe we should talk more about writing in future episodes, just because you're a writer and I'm a writer. Boy, that's what I wanted to do with my life. I still do. Um, <laughs> why, why do you laugh? Your life is almost over. It's... It certainly is. Yeah. yeah, and you know, my attitude is just, okay, if you're really on 20 drafts of this story and it's still that bad, then do another story. But, uh, you know, everybody writes in their own way. I mean, you and I are friends, and uh, some of the stuff that we write is, is fairly similar, and yet we have very different approaches to writing. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, who am I to say that they, they should do it like I do it? Yeah. But again, who am I to say that I'm not I'm not worthy to judge your work? I'm an editor. I got to judge. Yeah, you, it's it's a different role you find yourself in, but you got to I hope that the listener has noticed that we're getting more stories out in a more timely fashion. Uh, for a while there we were doing one every like two and a half weeks, and now we're almost up to a, one a week, and it's mostly due to the people who have helped us who volunteered to read the submissions, who volunteered to edit, who volunteered to do voices, uh, people who've, who've just, out of the goodness of their hearts. Yeah, the Dune Steve community has come together. And yeah, I, I just want to <laughs> thank the Academy for giving Wally Best Animated Film over Kung Fu Panda. I, you know what? I know people like Kung Fu Panda, but dude, <laughs> I, I just want to thank the people who have helped us. And I don't know that we've taken the opportunity to thank them enough, but it, it has made it easier. Definitely, yeah. It's made it work to the point where pretty soon I think we're going to be able to get to a story a week. We would have been that way for the entire month of February if we hadn't screwed the pooch that one time. But, you know. So, yes, thank you very, very much to all our volunteers for everything that you've done. And, and thank you to the people who have submitted stories, who have written. Thank you, Bosley Gravel. Thank you, you know, for thinking of us or, or, or sending us the things that you worked hard on. That's something we were talking about. I don't know if it'll make the show, but it is a lot of work to write a story or to write a novel or to screenplay or a poem and all that. And that's work that you could be spending sleeping or playing video games or surfing the internet. Yeah, or you watching could be television. doing something that's fun, that's not work whatsoever. Yet instead, you lay it out there on the line and you send it off and you don't know what we're going to say. We may say, hey, why don't you take this and double the length of it and add three characters that, um, and one of them that likes to fart a lot. So you don't, you know, you don't know what you're going to get and yet you still put it on the line. So thanks a lot for, for doing that. And keep it up, because seriously, it's worth it. I hope that you feel it's worth it. And I'd also like to thank, while we're thanking everybody, thanks the listeners for listening and for commenting on the blog and and for telling their friends and for donating and it, it's just been really great these these last few months and I just wanted to thank everybody. This is our Oscar show, isn't it? I guess so. I want to thank my agent. I want to thank President Obama. I want to thank that prostitute who made last night so memorable. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry. You know what? Let's just end this thing with the thanks okay. and all that stuff. I, normally the feel-good ending. Normally we would show this, they spend eternity and they turn into creepy old chinos. But let's not. Let's just fade off into the sunset. All right. Well, uh, I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. I want the people to know that they still have two out of three branches of government working for them. And that ain't bad. Have a nice week, folks. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them.
Take two. Yeah, but it's certainly not the case with movies. Yeah. Movies, uh, I think... that Well, that's all they do is remakes now, so... They're remaking Highlander right now, which is 86, so Starring granted it's a long Zach time ago. Efron. Probably. But was it 86 you, that the first one was? Hey, it's a movie that doesn't need to be remade, especially because it was a franchise. There were four or five films and two television series I and an animated series. For, I, I read that in the was new... an animated series? Yeah. In the new version Kids. for what we would call tweens today. We're the same audience that... <laughs> The, the, the Batman animated, animated, animated series or Transformers series can there be today. where the person to win has to chop the other guy's head off? Well, I don't know. I'm sure they sanitized it. I'm sure it was <laughs> no, you ridiculously just have to cut off gay. A wiener. Oh, that works. <laughs> well, no reason to tell you about the remake now. <laughs> you know how to kill the immortals. There's one immortal chick, and the guys are just like, "Oh shoot, we're <laughs> what screwed." Do we do? She is invulnerable. <laughs> 